pray for us? Gracious Father, we thank you for this holy word that was just read, and that we pray for the preaching of it, that your Holy Spirit would accompany the preached word, that it might minister deeply to each and every one of us, all for your glory and our good. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, friends, lately we have been going through the middle chapters of Genesis, covering the life and story of Abraham. And I think one of the major themes that has stuck out so far in this study of Abraham is the theme of waiting on God. Abraham, as we learned, was blessed to be the recipient of all these great promises from God. But at the same time, he was expected to patiently wait on God himself to fulfill these particular promises, to not take matters into his own hands, but instead to exercise faith and to wait on God. And think about just how difficult that must have been. Because we learned in Genesis 12 that Abraham is 75 years old when God promises to him to bless him and to make out of him this great nation. And then Abram has to wait 11 years for his first child to come. And that only happens because he grew impatient and he took matters into his own hands. So Genesis 16 ends by telling us that he was 86 years old when Hagar, his servant, bore Ishmael to Abram. And then we're told in this morning's text, in the start of chapter 17, that Abram was 99 years old. So that means 13 years later, that's when the Lord appears to him again to tell him that he and his wife Sarai are going to have a son this time next year. And this son is that promised son, that promised child that you should have been waiting for. Now, did you notice as we've been going through this study, as we've been looking at these chapters, did you notice how the author has made a point of pointing out Abram's age at each of these key moments in his story? We're given his age in every chapter because we're we're expected to add it up, to calculate how long it's been. How long did, Ab- did God expect Abram to wait for these promises to be fulfilled? Well, when you add it up, we learn that between Genesis 15, and that's where he was promised a chosen offspring, and eventually the provision of that offspring in Genesis 21, which we'll get to later, and that comes with the birth of Isaac, we learn that Abram was expected to wait on God for a quarter of a century, for 25 years. I mean, how many of us are prepared to wait on God for 25 years? Some of you have yet to even live that long. So imagine going your entire life waiting on God to fulfill a promise. Or for the rest of you, think back Think back to where you were and what you were doing 25 years ago. What were you doing? I mean, for me, I I was halfway through college. I was just getting back on track with my faith. I was just starting to walk with the Lord again. And so I'm trying to imagine in those days, embracing a particular promise of God, and then having to wait a quarter of a century for that to be fulfilled. That's hard. Or, or just think about looking forward, looking forward 25 years from now for God to fulfill a particular promise for you. I mean, for me, if I wait 25 years, I'll be almost 70. I, I, can I handle the wait? Can I handle waiting on God that long? And of course, the question is for all of you to answer. Can you handle waiting on God? And not just for a few weeks not just for a couple of months or for a year or two. I'm talking about for decades, for a quarter century, for for half a century, for an entire lifetime. Can you handle that? You know, my wife and I know how hard it is to to wait on God for for him to provide a child like Abram and Sarah, Sarah were waiting. I mean, we waited for over three years for our first to arrive and then over 10 years for our second. And we weren't even promised children. We didn't have a promise from God to bank on. 
And so I can't imagine how much harder it was for Abram to wait on a promised child for 25 years. But by Genesis 17, it's been almost that long. And so we can understand by this point in his life that Abraham's faith is a bit shaky. It's wavering because his wife's womb is still empty and his home is filled with strife all because of his impatience and his, his foolishness and how he dealt with his servant Hagar and, and the son that they bore. So I'm not surprised if Abram is wondering if this covenant that God made with him is still intact. I mean, maybe perhaps God has, has amended it some, or, or at worst, maybe he's abandoned the covenant altogether. So I'm sure there was some doubt and some fear and some anxiety building up in Abram's heart. But then God shows up in chapter 17, with blessed assurance. He reaffirms his commitment to his covenant and to all the covenant promises that he made to Abram, including all the promises about land and about offspring. And he seals this covenant in this chapter by giving Abram a covenant sign. We know it as the sign of circumcision. Now, friends, this, is, this can be an awkward topic in our day because circumcision, you know, is a, is a private medical matter between parents and their, you know, newborn son. But back then, in the Old Testament and also into the New Testament, circumcision was not a privately, privately discussed matter. No, this was a public, heavily discussed matter with social and religious ramifications. And so, friends, it is important for us to understand the significance of this covenant sign. So, as we get into chapter 17, what I want to do this morning is to make some observations for you that I hope will will bring to you as well some blessed assurance to all of you who are in a covenant relationship with God. I, I hope you come away with greater assurance. And for those of you who desire to be in a relationship with God through faith in the gospel. I hope that this text will give you comfort and give you assurance. And so if you want to follow along, look in your outline, look in your bulletin, you'll see an outline there. And these are the three observations we're going to make about a covenant relationship with God. First of all, God's covenant is meant to bless the nations through a blessed people. Second, we'll see how God's covenant is sealed for Israel by the sign of circumcision. But third, we're going to see how God's covenant is secured for the nations, for all of us, by the circumcision of Christ. All right, so that's where we're going in this message this morning. But let's begin by considering the purpose that God had in making a covenant with Abram in the first place. And I'm going to argue that it was to bless the nations through a blessed people. God entered into a covenant relationship with Abram, and he committed himself to blessing this man so that he might be a blessing to others. That intent, that purpose, was already laid out for us in an earlier chapter we already looked at in Genesis 12. In Genesis 12, verses 2 to 3, those two verses are foundational to the Abrahamic covenant. Those two verses, Genesis 12, 2 to 3, contain six promises from God. The first three are directed towards Abram. First, I will make of you a great nation. Second, I will bless you. And third, I will make your name great. These are all directed towards Abram. And then the last three promises are directed towards the world, towards the nations. Fourth, I will bless those who bless you. Fifth, I will curse those who dishonor you. And sixth, I will bless all the families of the earth through you, Abram, and all of your offspring. That was chapter 12. But ever since then, we've seen Abram primarily concerned with the fulfillment of just those first three promises. The ones that relate to blessing him and giving him a great name and making him into a great nation. So far, so far, he has shown very little interest in the last three promises, which are more concerned with blessing all nations through him. Which, of course, is severely short-sighted according to God's purposes. Yes, those first three promises are foundational. Yes, you could argue they are the priority. 
But the reason why you're seeking the first three promises to be fulfilled is because you're ultimately wanting to see the last three fulfilled. Abram should be seeking to be blessed so that he might be a blessing to others. That's the way God intends it to, 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 to happen. Think about it this way. I, uh, I've recently been, been watching these documentaries on big cats, like, you know, lions and, and leopards. I, I, don't, I don't know why. It just, it just it showed up on my, uh, you know, uh, as, a, as a suggested uh, a show. I'm like, oh, yeah, actually, I, I am interested in that. So I started watching this, these documentaries. And, and the plot line, no matter which animal it is, it's all the same. The mama lion goes out hunting, and she has all of these near misses. And, of course, you know, she's facing all these new hardships because of climate change. Uh, so, you know, you know, her natural prey is dwindling, and she hasn't eaten for days. She's starving. She doesn't give up. She keeps hunting until she finally snags a prey. And now you see this scene of her just gorging on her kill, and she's warding off the scavengers, you know, the hyenas, the vultures, you know, until she's eaten all she wants. And then... What do you see in the final scene? In the final scene, you see mama in her den nursing her newborn cubs. And then you realize, yes, she was seeking to satisfy her hunger. Yes, she she was seeking the blessing of a satisfying meal. But why? Because only until she was nourished could she produce the nourishing milk that her babies needed to survive. She sought blessing to be a blessing to others. So friends, it it is good and it is right for you to seek God's blessing in your life. You should pray for good health. You can pray even for prosperity. You can ask God to get you into that school or or, or to get you hired at that company. You can pray those prayers. You can ask him to grant you a spouse. You can ask him to to give you and your spouse a child. You don't have to feel bad for, for asking him to bless you in these ways. But the question is, what do you plan on doing with that blessing? Are you going to just keep it for yourself? Or are you going to share it with others? What is your final objective of that blessing that you seek? Your good or the good of others? Just know you are authorized by Scripture to seek out God's blessing for yourself. But so that you might be a blessing to others. Let's keep that straight. Let's let's, let's make sure our priorities are straight. I think that's a message many of us need to hear. And it's certainly a message Abram needed to hear here in Genesis 17. Note the emphasis here in this chapter on the fulfillment of those last three promises that God made to him. The blessed nations through Abram. Look look at verse 4. He was reminded that you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. Or look at verse 6. God says, I will make you into nations and kings shall come from you. And of course, he's given a new name here in this chapter. And this new name underlines the ultimate objective to bless the nations. Listen to verse 5. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. And that's what Abraham means. It means father of a multitude. So this change of names is meant to change Abraham's outlook. Expanding the range of his concerns to go beyond himself, beyond just his own family, to now reach all the families, all the nations of the earth. Ultimately, he should seek blessing in order to be a blessing, not just to Israel, not just to one particular ethnic group, but to be a blessing to all the people groups of the world. All nations. That should be his ultimate concern. Now, God could foresee that Abraham has some doubts here, has some skepticism whether he's ever going to live up to this new name of his. 
And so the Lord begins this encounter in chapter 17 by revealing a new name of his own. In verse 1, look at there, he says, I am God Almighty. I am El Shaddai. That's what the Hebrew says. That name is meant to signify God's power and God's sovereignty over all things. And when a name like El Shaddai is revealed in conjunction with covenant promises, well, the whole point is that these promises that God is giving to you is guaranteed by none other than God Almighty. El Shaddai is backing these promises. And that's what Abraham needed to hear. Look at verse 17 with me. He was definitely skeptical. Verse 17, then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who is 99 years old, bear a child? He's laughing to himself. Now, it's ironic that in the very first instance in Scripture where Abraham's new name is used, It's used in the context of him laughing at the very idea that his new name is meant to convey. There's some irony there. Can't see how this is all going to work. Because, I mean, he has a basic understanding of biology. And he knows that he and his wife are way past childbearing years. And so he urges the Lord to perhaps consider fulfilling all these promises through the son that he already has. Through Ishmael. Look at verse 18. And Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. He thought it was more feasible to go through Ishmael. I mean, it's easier to work with a child that you have than to wait on the child of promise. The first only requires sight. I can see the kid right here. The other requires faith. You've got to trust God on that. You have to wait on God for that. Which is why God reveals, to him, reveals himself to Abraham as God Almighty, El Shaddai. It's like the Lord is saying to him, Abraham, Abraham, don't give up on your hope for numerous offspring. There's no need to resort to to human solutions and, and human shortcuts. Everything I promised you will come to pass. Don't forget who I am. I'm El Shaddai. I'm God Almighty. Nothing is too difficult for me. And so now, friends, I think we have a better understanding as to why God had Abraham wait 25 years, a quarter century, before giving him that promised child. Because earlier, 25 years earlier, he was too self-reliant. He thought he was mighty enough for himself. He thought he was clever enough to make things happen. Chapter 16, as we saw last week, is a perfect example of that. But now... After waiting all these years, exhausting all human options, Abraham has been brought to a point of utter dependency. Now his only option is to trust in God Almighty to pull through. And that's, that's what happened. I think that's what happened to him as he was lying there on his face. It started with laughing. But then it ended with trusting. I believe Abraham in that moment, was granted great faith. And Abraham believed in spite of what seemed impossible. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 4, verse 18, that in hope, Abraham believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. I love that that phrase. In hope, he believed against hope. What that means is that there was no human reason to have any hope of this promise being fulfilled. And yet he still hoped because he hoped in El Shaddai. Nothing is too difficult for God Almighty. No addiction is too great for God to break. No sin is too evil for God to forgive. No heart is too hard for God to melt. Friends, you have Good reason to believe against hope if your hope is ultimately in God Almighty to pull through for you. That's, that's, what, that's what we learn here in the beginning of this text. And if we go back and look at our text starting in verse 9, we see the Lord graciously grant even greater assurance 
by not just giving Abraham, Abraham a new, uh, uh, give, uh, revealing a new name to him, but by giving Abraham a covenant sign. And this is our second observation here. God's covenant is sealed for Israel by the sign of circumcision. Now, as we mentioned earlier, God has a tendency of sealing his covenant promises by granting a covenant sign. We've already seen him do this earlier when we had studied the first part of Genesis as we were going through Genesis 1 to 11. Um, do, you, do you recall back then when we studied Genesis 9, God gave Noah the rainbow. Why? As a sign of his covenant promise to never again destroy the earth by a flood. So the way that works is that every time you would see a rainbow in the sky after a big storm, that rainbow is to function as a sign and a reminder of that particular promise of the Lord. And then later on in the scriptures, if you get to Exodus chapter 31, we're told that the Sabbath, the Sabbath day, is also a sign of the covenant between God and the people of Israel. The Israelites were to observe the Sabbath, and that entire day of resting from labor served as a reminder that they ultimately trust in their creator God for their daily provision, not in their own hands. And so whether they're looking at a rainbow or they're looking at the calendar and they see the Sabbath, they are reminded of God and his covenant promises. And so in similar fashion, what we have here in chapter 17 is God giving Abraham the sign of circumcision as a reminder of the covenant promise to bless him and to bless the nations through him. Now, just think about this, friends. Just as the rainbow and the Sabbath day already existed long before their respective covenants were established, well, in the same way, Circumcision already existed as a cultural practice in those ancient days, long before Genesis 17. But now, because it's associated with a covenant of God, this practice, this ancient practice, carries now new meaning and significance. But to appreciate this new meaning, we need to understand how circumcision was practiced in ancient Near Eastern cultures. Now, that might surprise some of you. Because perhaps you were led to believe that circumcision was unique to the Jewish people alone. But actually, it was already part of many cultures in those days, particularly the Egyptian culture. Ancient Egyptians practiced circumcision. And that's important because Egyptian culture serves as the primary backdrop as Israel in those days was forming its identity as a, na as a nation and all of its cultural practices was formed in contrast to, is, to Egypt. And so the question is, how did the ancient Egyptians practice circumcision? Well, they essentially treated it as an initiation rite for their priests. It wasn't for all male Egyptians. It was only for those of the priestly class. They were the only the ones circumcised, and that usually happened either in adulthood or in puberty. It was how a priest would demonstrate his devotion to the Egyptian gods. But of course, in contrast, in Israel, every single male was obligated to be circumcised. And it occurred not years later, but right after birth, eight days later to be exact. And that's because unlike Egypt, Israel was meant to be a kingdom of priests. The people of God are a holy nation, a kingdom of priests, we're told in Exodus 19. So every male is circumcised as a means of consecrating himself to the Lord to serve as his priests. So while at the same time, it's true that the, Le the tribe of Levi eventually goes on to play a very uniquely priestly role in Israel, there is a sense in which all Israelite males functioned as priests. It makes sense considering how Abraham and his offspring are uniquely responsible as covenantal partners to mediate God's blessings to the nations. And what's the primary role of a priest? Is to mediate the blessings of God. 
So as a sign, that was circumcision's primary message. It was communicating this, this relationship that we have with God as we, as, uh, that we serve as priests to distribute and to mediate his blessings to the world. But this sign of circumcision also served as a warning sign. You see, the ancient Egyptians, their practice of circumcision didn't involve the complete removal of the foreskin. You would merely make an incision. But this is where Israel's practice of circumcision was different. It was unique. Because in Israel, the foreskin was completely cut off. And the primary reason is to graphically convey the covenant curse of being completely cut off by God. And you see that warning issued in verse 14. Look at verse 14. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. That's the warning. That's the covenant curse. You be cut or you be cut off from God's covenant community. So, putting it all together, what does the sign of circumcision signify? It certainly signifies that you are set apart as a member of the covenant people of God, and you are uniquely called to mediate his blessings to the nations. And so if you refuse that sign, you are actually rejecting the role of priest, and you are cutting yourself off from God's kingdom of priests. That's what's being communicated. Now, uh, granted, there, uh, there was no female equivalent. And so I know some of you ladies are wondering, well, what about the daughters of Israel? Were they part of the covenant community? Well, yes, of course, they were. Obviously, they couldn't receive this particular sign, but they were still recognized as members of the covenant community of God. Now, most commentators, as I was, I was curious about that question as well, I was looking it up, and most commentators say the lack of a female equivalent here is best explained by the fact that it was a heavily patriarchal culture in those days, and, and that daughters of Israel were expected to eventually be in a one flesh union with their husbands. And so, only one sign of the covenant was needed for a pair who enjoys a one flesh union. That's the typical explanation for why there wasn't an equivalent for her daughters. Now, thinking about this, though, does raise a very important and, and rather awkward question for us to, to ponder. If circumcision is a sign then who is it a sign intended for? In other words, who's supposed to see this sign? Because Israel's observance of the Sabbath, okay, that, that was a very public sign. That was a public thing. They, they lived out a very different way on the Sabbath than everyone else. And so the watching world could see them um, embrace this sign. It set them apart from the surrounding nations. But circumcision as we already mentioned, was not a practice unique just to Israel. And besides, I mean, just think about it. How is the watching world going to know that you are set apart by circumcision when the sign itself is concealed by your clothing? People aren't going to see this particular sign. And so that's why it's argued that circumcision is a sign primarily for the one who is circumcised. Every time you look at your body, you are reminded that you have been set apart as a member of the covenant community of God. I mean, just think, think about it this way. Why do I wear this? Why do I wear this wedding ring? I mean, does it carry some kind of inherent power in itself? I mean, does it, does it make me married, you know, the moment I slip it on my finger? Of course not. I mean, I, I bought this ring, you know, during my engagement. And so obviously, you know, I had to size it, I had to make sure it fit. And so I, I tried it on plenty of times before I actually got married. But that moment I, I slipped it on, it didn't suddenly make me married. The ring is only significant because it serves as a sign of my marital covenant that I entered into on my wedding day. So every morning, the... Every morning when I put on this ring or, or, or when I look at it throughout the day, 
my wedding ring serves as a reminder that I am in a covenant relationship with my wife. And so I think in the same way, circumcision in and of itself means nothing. It, it, it has no inherent power to save you. But when associated with a covenant, as a covenant sign, circumcision now serves as a powerful reminder. Every day, the men of Israel would have a clear reminder that they are in a covenant relationship with God and that they are set apart to serve as his priests. They are responsible for mediating his blessings to the nations. And just think about, think about how the, the, the mark of circumcision was a blessing to Abraham in particular. Because after receiving the sign, we learned that he still had to wait on God. All those promises were still a future possibility. They weren't a present reality. Isaac wasn't there yet. But at least now he has a sign that he can carry with him wherever he goes. Wherever he goes, he has a constant reminder of God's promise to bless him. A reminder that he is in a covenant relationship with God Almighty. That, my friends, is what the sign of circumcision was intended for. It was intended to assure you of God's covenantal love and commitment. But if you trace out the story of Israel, we see that the covenant people of God, they take a sign that was designed to offer assurance, and sadly, they turned it into a rule designed to exclude the nations. Circumcision was supposed to serve as a reminder of of a covenant that was meant to bless the nations through a blessed people, but instead it became a tool of exclusion and a means of othering the uh, other people, othering the foreigners. The term uncircumcision quickly became a pejorative. It became an insult. It was a byword. But that's why another covenant had to be established and another sign had to be given so that the nations would not be neglected. And that leads us to our third and final observation. God's covenant is secured for the nations by the circumcision of Christ. But before we consider how the practice of circumcision developed as Scripture was progressively revealed to us, you'll see in just today's passage, there's evidence in today's text alone that would push back against this tendency to turn circumcision into a tool for exclusion. I mean, just look with me at verses 12 to 13. The Lord says there that every male in your house, both your sons and your household slaves who are foreigners, they they shall all surely be circumcised. Now that right there, that accommodation to welcome foreign slaves into the covenant community by giving them the sign of circumcision as well, that right there should signal an open stance, a, a welcome posture towards the nations. Again, God's people are to be a kingdom of priests, mediating blessings to the nations. And it starts right here in the home by blessing the foreigner under your roof. You mediate blessing to him as well. And then you keep reading in places like Deuteronomy 10, and you come across more signals telling us that even though circumcision of the flesh is important for God's covenant people, what's more important than that is circumcision of the heart. And so we read in Deuteronomy 10, verse 16, the Lord says, Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. Or Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul that you may live. And so you see in the early pages of Scripture, it's already very clear that what's more important than the outward sign of circumcision is the inward reality that it's meant to convey. Setting apart your heart for God is far more important than marking your flesh as different than other people. But unfortunately, people of God didn't pick up on all of these signals. And so by the time you get to the New Testament, the early church They had to contend with Jewish Christians who treated circumcision of the flesh flesh 
as the defining mark of who is in the covenant community of God. They insisted that Gentile converts to Christianity had to receive the sign of circumcision. And that false gospel became a stumbling block to faith for the nation. It undermined the sufficiency of Christ to save all peoples. It was sending the message that if the nations want to join the covenant community of God, then you're going to need to rely on Christ and circumcision. Christ is not enough. You need to add circumcision to that if you want to be a part of God's people. And that message, that false gospel, stirred up no little debate. In fact, the first theological controversy that the early church had to face centered on this issue of circumcision. You find that in Acts chapter 15. And it was about the question of whether Gentiles had to bear the mark if they wished to share in the covenant blessings that were given to Abram and his offspring. And the biggest defender of the sufficiency of Christ and the biggest advocate for removing this stumbling block of circumcision so that God's blessing might now overflow to the nations was, of course, the Apostle Paul. In Romans chapter 4, verses 9 to 12, he reminds his readers that Abraham entered that covenant with God back in Genesis chapter 15. That's when Scripture said that he believed God's promises. That's when Scripture says that his faith was counted to him as righteousness. And from then on, from chapter 15 on, he was in a right relationship with God. He was in a covenant relationship with the Lord. And then, almost 25 years later, Abraham finally received the sign of circumcision. And so that long wait makes it obvious that his circumcision was merely a sign pointing back to the inner reality of faith in God and his promises that began in in Genesis 15. And Paul goes on to say that that there's another purpose for why there's this quarter century gap between Genesis 15 to 17. It's not only just to teach Abraham himself to wait on God, but it is now to make Abraham, quote, the father of all who believe without being circumcised. In other words, all those who share in the faith of Abraham are the true descendants of Abraham, and we are the recipients of all of the covenant blessings that he received. And the reason why this is now made available to all of us Those of us, I assume all of us here are Gentiles. We're all the nations here. I don't think there's any Jewish uh, person here. I mean, you you might be, but uh, I think all of us are the Gentiles here. Why is it available to us? Why do we have this blessing? Why can we enjoy covenant blessings given to covenant people of God? It's not because the sign of circumcision has now lost its significance. And I mean, you know, it's, it, 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 it suddenly just became completely meaningless. And it's just, you know, let's just toss it aside. Uh, we realize, oh, it was just this archaic practice. We don't need to do that anymore. Now, the reason why it's available to us is because a certain circumcision took place in the course of redemptive history that fulfilled and superseded the sign of circumcision. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 11, the Apostle Paul talks about how Christians have been circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by the circumcision of Christ. Now, first, you might be confused there, wondering how our salvation is tied up with Jesus' circumcision. But then you realize that Paul is not referring to the cutting off that happened to Jesus when he was an eight-day-old baby. No, here in Colossians, he is referring to what happened to Jesus on the cross. On the cross, Christ experienced a cosmic cutting off. He was cut off by the Father. He was forsaken by God. He bore the covenantal curses that we deserve. And and just as God took a pre-existing sign like circumcision and incorporated it into his covenant, transforming its meaning and significance, Jesus 
he took a pre-existing symbol, the Roman cross. He incorporated it into the new covenant, and he now transformed its meaning and significance. It no longer communicates a message of Roman power and Roman cruelty. But now the cross communicates the good news that we can be recipients of all the covenant blessings that are found here in Genesis. We can be secure in God's love because Christ received the ultimate circumcision for us. At the same time, we can be challenged as a kingdom of priests to mediate this gospel and all of its blessings to the nations. That, my friends, is now what the sign of the cross means for us. So maybe some of you here have been hesitating to give your life over to Christ. You're not sure if you're ready to follow him, to give him your everything, because you're still waiting on him waiting on God to show you a sign, waiting on God to show you a sign that proves that he's real or that he really wants to be in a relationship with you? Or could it be that the sign you're looking for has been in front of you this entire time? Look to the cross, my friends. That's the only sign you're going to need if you want to know that a covenant-making God is real and that he really loves you. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for the cross. Thank you for Jesus taking on the cross for us, being cut off for us, shedding his blood for our sins and our salvation. Thank you, Jesus. We pray all this in your name. Amen.